Epilepsy is really common. About one out of every hundred people in the population will have a fit at some point in their life. There's two peaks, uh, one in childhood, uh, which reflects brain injury uh, during birth or soon after birth usually, and the next peak is in the over 60s because stroke becomes more common in that age group. Fundamental epilepsy is an electrical discharge in part of the brain or the whole part of the brain. A classification of epilepsy is uh, a big topic in its own right, but very simply, epilepsy can be what's called partial or generalised. Partial means that the electrical discharge is in just one part of the brain. And that can be what's called simple partial, that means the person is fully conscious of what's happening. For example, you can have a, a focal motor seizure where the hand twitches and the person's fully aware of it. Just one part of the brain is discharging. It could be complex partial, which means the person loses awareness, loses consciousness. The other sort of fit is generalised, and although it may start in part of the brain, the electrical discharge quickly spreads to the whole brain. And that causes what, what people understand as a classic fit. It used to be called a grand mal seizure, now called a generalised tonic-clonic seizure. Because the person will suddenly lose consciousness, we go into a tonic phase, which is a muscle spasm, and then a clonic phase where the muscles jerk. And that's a classic seizure that perhaps everyone will recognise. But there are other varieties of that. There's what's called absent seizures, where the person simply loses awareness and, and stops in the middle of a sentence, just like that, without being aware of it, and carries on as though nothing has happened. There are other sorts, for example, atonic, where the person loses all muscle tone and drops to the floor, or myoclonic, where there's jerking of the muscles. So there's a whole variety of, of different sorts of seizures. It's not just that classic tonic-clonic seizure. The other way to classify seizures is what causes it, and sometimes as a, as a local cause, for example, stroke or brain tumour. But commonly, of course, it's generalised or idiopathic. Uh, people don't quite know what causes it, and that's common in some of the childhood epilepsies. And of course everyone knows of febrile convulsions which are so common in childhood when you get a fever from a flu or something else, uh, you get a, a seizure as a result of that increased temperature. So there's a whole variety of seizure types and seizure causes. So how would we investigate uh, a seizure? Well the first thing to do is to take a history uh, from the person, and most particularly in epilepsy is actually to take a history uh, from someone who may have been with them at the time, a partner for example because often the person themselves don't, don't remember what happens. So you need a, a good history from someone who was with them at the time. You need to examine the person to see if there is any evidence of an underlying cause, such as a tumour. Investigation otherwise is fairly straightforward, and is often through an EEG, an electroencephalogram. These really just monitor the electrical activity of the brain. Unfortunately, of course, they can be quite normal when you're not having a seizure. Sometimes they can be abnormal in between the fits, but often not. So sometimes you have to revert to prolonged recording, uh, walking around with a, with a tape recording machine uh, to see if there's epileptic activity, uh, even if it's not manifest, over a 24-hour period. And sometimes you can even do intracranial monitoring, uh, often that, as a prelude to surgery. And often you also uh, do brain imaging, CT scan, MRI scan, uh, to determine whether, uh, particularly in adult onset epilepsy, whether there is actually an underlying cause. In rehabilitation units such as Christchurch, we're often looking though at what's called post-traumatic epilepsy. That's epilepsy occurring after a brain injury, which is not surprising. Brain injury causes areas of damage in the brain by definition, and those areas of scarring can act as a focus for epileptic discharge. Sometimes we can do a little bit in prediction of whether someone is likely to get an epileptic seizure. There's early epilepsy, which is defined as epilepsy within the first week of the uh, accident. And the risk of that is increased if someone has had a depressed skull fracture, a break in the skull with a bone pushed in towards the brain. Or if there's an intracranial hematoma, as it's called, which is a, a blood clot, if you like, in the brain tissue. Or if there's a prolonged period of amnesia, which reflects the severity of the injury. And those things together make it more likely if you're going to get epilepsy in the first week. Perhaps more important is whether you have epilepsy in the longer term, after you've gone home, so-called late epilepsy. And overall, about 5% of people with a brain injury will develop late epilepsy. We can predict that to some extent. If you've had early epilepsy, 
as about a 25% risk of developing late epilepsy. That goes up to 31% of those who've had an intracranial hematoma, a blood clot in the brain, and 15% risk if you've had a depressed skull fracture. And if you've got none of those three risk factors, your chances of getting late epilepsy is only about 1%. So you can predict it to an extent. The important thing to remember, though, is that those who develop epilepsy after brain injury, uh, about 60% have developed that seizure within the first year, as you might expect. But surprisingly, that means 40% develop their first seizure after one year, about a quarter between one to four years, and about 16% still develop their first seizure after brain injury over four years later, which is perhaps surprising. How will we treat a seizure? Well, a, a short-term seizure, an ordinary seizure, often needs no treatment at all. If the person's having one of those generalised fits, all you have to do is lay them on the floor, or a bed if that's more convenient, in the, what's called the recovery position. And after, usually after a minute or so, uh, they recover, often need sleep afterwards, but you don't need to do anything particular other than those basic first aid principles. Sometimes though, one seizure leads to another, and one after the other is called status epilepticus, and that's a real problem. It's, a, it's, a, it's associated with quite a high mortality, up to a third. So time in those circumstances is important. You've got to treat the person quickly, get them to hospital as soon as you can, um, and they may, may need oxygen, they may need intravenous access to give uh, anti-epileptic drugs, such as diazepam, for example. So that, that's a, an exception, and a quite rare, but nevertheless, that's a, a medical emergency and needs treating appropriately. How will we generally treat epilepsy, though? And the first thing to say is that if someone, say a year after a brain injury, has one seizure, you wouldn't necessarily want to treat it. Um, because they may have not, never have another one. Would you want to treat at all? Really depends on the circumstances of that person. If they really can't afford because of their job to have another seizure, then you may want to treat them earlier than if someone who is perhaps older, more sedentary, who doesn't require, for example, the ability to drive. And incidentally, anyone who has a seizure has to inform the DVLA and they often then stop from driving for a period of time till they can determine how frequent and how severe the epilepsy is. Uh, so that's the first thing to say. You might not want to treat at all, or you might want to wait a period of time before you think, well, maybe we should start to treat this. Um, obviously, we have to treat the primary cause if there is one. If someone's had a, a tumour, it may need separate treatment. But if we assume that someone's had a brain injury and they've got epilepsy as a result, there and we've decided to treat, then these days there's a whole variety of anti-epilepsy drugs that can be used. But you have to combine that treatment with counselling, information and advice about lifestyle and choices that people have to make if they're having epilepsy. The basic principles of drug treatment is to, if possible, use just one drug. And the prescribers must know all about that drug because there are a lot of different problems with different drugs. You should, the principle is to increase the drug dose slowly until you've controlled or until you've got toxicity from that drug. And if you haven't got full control, you need then to swap to another drug. Some drugs lend themselves to drug level monitoring, so you can see how much of the drug is circulating in the blood. And you only add another drug when monotherapy, single drug therapy, has definitely failed. And indeed, the vast majority of people, over 80%, some would say 90%, can be fully controlled on one drug. It's only that tiny minority that need two drugs, or very rarely three drugs. And of course we have to use with caution in people who are pregnant, or elderly, or have renal failure, kidney failure, and such like. It's not the time in this talk to go through all the different drugs available. Uh, some names may be familiar, like carbamazepine is very common, known as Tegretol. There's uh, other drugs called sodium valproate, old-fashioned drugs called phenytoin, some drugs are still very good, but associated with problematic side effects like phenobarbital and isn't very rarely used these days. And there's a whole variety of modern drugs that uh, treat particular sorts of seizures really well with very few side effects. But that is a very specialist field, and someone with epilepsy needs to really be under the care of an epilepsy consultant, a neurologist, and the whole epilepsy team. And these days there are epilepsy nurses that know an awful lot about drugs and monitoring of the drugs and counselling, uh, information sharing, and there's really good epilepsy teams. And someone with epilepsy that's ongoing 
really needs to be under the care of a team like that. The other question arises, of course, is when to stop treatment. Of course, the drugs often control epilepsy, as I've said, really well. And there's no hard and fast rule. There are some people who definitely can't have another seizure if they can possibly help it because of their job. So you might want to keep that person on treatment. Otherwise, the people may be well controlled, but they don't tolerate the drug very well and they'd rather get off it if at all possible. There's a general rule. Uh, epilepsy consultants would normally think about taking someone off a drug if they've been seizure free for a couple of years. And the, the, the message there is to withdraw the drug very, very slowly and never abruptly. And as a, a side point to make is that if someone's on epilepsy drugs, then it is absolutely key to keep those drugs going, not to run out um, in the pharmacy. So they've always got a supply and always take their drugs. If people forget to take the drugs or someone forgets to give it to them, uh, then they can have a, a withdrawal seizure, as it's called. That's a key point, is to remember to take the epilepsy drugs whilst you're, take, whilst you're on the medication. A few people, probably 10% or so, have resistant epilepsy. As I've said, they may need two drugs or even three drugs. And sometimes there are different treatments that can be tried. Uh, various rare forms of epilepsy in childhood may respond to steroids. There's a rare childhood form of epilepsy with very persistent seizures called Dravet syndrome that responds, for example, to cannabis. Some use diets. And sometimes these days, the surgery, where the, the irritable part of the brain can actually be removed by the neurosurgeon and that focus of epileptic activity can go away. Overall, though, um, epilepsy is reasonably well treated in 80 to 90% of people can be very well controlled using a single anticonvulsant drug if they need one at all. So overall, there's an excellent prognosis. So in conclusion, epilepsy is really quite a common problem in society, but particularly in the context of brain injury. But fortunately, usually, it's easy to treat, although we have to remember that it's also easy to treat badly. So people need to be under the care of a good quality epilepsy service, and with that, help guidance and support that can usually lead a normal life.